run through the personality of God on the second page of, of part one. Let's pray. Father, we just come before you tonight, Lord. We do thank you for this day that you've made. We thank you, Lord, for the opportunity you've given us to just come, Lord, and break bread together, to come, Lord, into your presence, to encourage one another, Lord. Iron sharpening iron, Lord, we desire to come into your presence tonight. Lord, we thank you tonight, Lord, for Rick being here, Lord, and you brought him through the surgery, Lord, and he's walking good, and we say thank you. We ask, Lord, that you remember brothers and sisters been in and out of the hospital, Lord, and, and, and even now, Lord, Jerry Eddie's in the hospital. We ask that you just be with him. Be with Sheldon tonight, Lord, as he's over in St. Francis, Lord. And Lord, we ask that you would dry that infection up that is in his body again for the third or fourth time. Uh, we come tonight, dear Holy Father, Lord. We want to be mindful, Lord, that you're God. And you're God in everything that we find ourselves doing. And so as we look at this word tonight, Lord, I pray that we can be encouraged. Knowing that you are in control, Lord. Knowing that all power is in your hand. You are God, the creator of all things. The almighty God, mighty God you are. And Lord, and we are in you and you are in us. And Lord, I thank you tonight. And so as we come, Lord, we just want to give you praise for each and every one that is here. Thank you, Lord, for the brothers that went out to New York, Lord, bringing them home safely. Uh, Lord, we thank you for the opportunity you gave. Now, be with us. Lead us and direct us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Page 2, you will look and see the personality of God. We looked at 1 Thessalonians 1, verses 8 through 9. The Lord's message rang out from you. You not only in Macedonia, uh, but Achaia. Your faith in God has become known everywhere. Therefore, we do not need to say anything about it, for they themselves report what kind of reception you gave us. They tell you, they tell how you turn to God from the idols to serve the living and true God. If you're on part one, you're just on the second page of part one of God. Part two says personality of God. Number two. The Bible talks about this, that Paul is encouraging the church there at Thessalonica. He's letting them know that, that God has been faithful, and they're faithful in their trust and their faith in him. And that uh, and because of it, the faith in God has become known everywhere. Their life has been seen. The Spirit of God has moved upon them, and others have experienced it and been blessed with it. He says, so I, we do not need to say anything about it, for they themselves report what kind of reception you gave us. They tell how you turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God. I think it's so important that we understand you'll never have to boast about what God is doing in your life if you're just living it. People will recognize it. Those that know you will say that there's something different about you. They'll know. They may not understand your God. They may not even believe in God, but they'll know you're different. They'll know that something has touched your life, changed your life. Whatever it is, they know that there's something that's come upon you. And sometimes I struggle with the idea that as Christians, we're trying to explain some, to somebody why we're doing good things. Christians are supposed to do good things. Should not pat you on the back for being a Christian. Should not pat you on the back for you doing the things that you're called to do in Christ Jesus. Now, I mean, we all encourage one another. We want to spur one another on to the works of, of the gospel. But you're just doing what Christians ought to do. And that's what Paul is just saying. I don't have to say anything. It's already been spoken of, of how you have received and how God has touched your life. And your life has turned from the things of the world. And you are serving the living and true God. It says the Bible reveals God as personality. He is called the living God, the true God, the one possessing self-consciousness and self-determination. His personality is shown and what he has, what he does, such as God is love. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, whosoever believed in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And then it talks about God hates six things that the Lord hates. We looked at them. There were 
There are six things the Lord hates, seven that are detestable to him. Haughty eyes, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked schemes, feet that are quick to rush into evil, a false witness who pours out lies, and a person who stirs up conflict in the community. You too have found that you have met that person from time to time. You've seen those people, and they rub you even the wrong way. And so I'm mindful that I too was like them. And sometimes, it still sometimes crops up. But the sense that there's a character that God is calling us to, and that this God of love also says that I hate those things that do not represent me that does not reflect my glory. And if he hates those things in the world, how much more would he feel against it when it's his, his children that are doing it? These things should not even be named among us as believers in Christ Jesus. But we know that we're not perfect, that we all sin, come short of the glory of God. But here is telling us that because of the personality of God, that that is deposited in us in our faith through Christ Jesus. And so then he has told us to step up, that we should find ourselves elevating into his presence, that he should be in our life, it should be such a way that he's elevating us from glory to glory to glory. Talks about God cares, he cares for you. Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. I think it's important that we remember the Lord cares. Because sometimes in our life, in our busyness, we think nobody cares about what's going on with me. Have you ever had a poor me experience? <laughs> Woe is me. You know, nobody knows the trouble I see. Nobody knows but Jesus. Amen. <laughs> but you know, we find that no one's exempt. Everybody goes through something from time to time. Everybody finds themselves on that side where they're wondering, Lord, where are you at? But it says when you are anxious about the things in this world, things that are out of your control. See, there's some things we can do. And there's things that are important, and we can do something about it. But there's some things that are important, and you can't do anything about it. You can't change it. And in the midst of those things, when you can't make it happen, happen there are times that you become anxious about the things that are going around uh, in your life and, and things that are coming upon you. Here it just says that we need to put our trust in God and cast all your anxieties, those concerns on Him because it cares for you. Because if you can't do anything about it, who then can do something for you? The Word tells us it's God. That it is Him that is able to do exceedingly above all that we have asked or hoped for. It is Him that is able to take this brokenness of our lives and begin to elevate it in a way that it will glorify Him. But sometimes I just got to learn how to cast it. I just need to know how to just place it into his hand. But you know, we sometimes say, Lord, I, I, I give it to you. Here, take it. Take it, Lord. You, you can have it. But we don't want to let go of it. Because why? we still think that God may do something, but he may not do it in the way that I want it done. And so it says when you're casting your cares upon the Lord, then you're trusting him to know exactly what you need and do it the way that will bring him glory and bring it, bring him honor in the way that he does it in your life. Have you ever not had God, have you ever had God do something in your life in a way that when it was all done, you know it was a God thing, but it wasn't the way you would have done it? Amen. 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 God did it. I, I, I sometimes thought it was the, the long way around. Surely, God, you can get from point A to point B quicker than this. But when I found myself being still, looked at the finished result of it, I saw that God was able to put some things together that I hadn't thought about, hadn't seen, hadn't, hadn't perceived might happen, come along, and he worked this thing to my good. And so not only when it says cast the cares, it's talking about we also trust God when we're handing these things to him, that he will work it to your good. God cares. He cares for you. So then it tells us that God grieves. He was grieved in his heart. Genesis 6, 5 and 6. The Lord saw how great and wickedness of the human race had become on the earth, and that every inclination of the thoughts of the human heart was only evil all the time. The Lord regretted that he had made human beings on the earth. 
and his heart was deeply troubled. I never felt it, but I think I heard my parents mumble that once. <laughs> that I had grieved them and they were sorry. Sorry. Maybe you understand a little bit what God was saying. That his expectations of us is this. And did you catch it? God's expectation is this. God is here. And his expectation of us is to find ourselves in his presence. That we find ourselves in heavenly places. That we find ourselves with a viewpoint of life where he looks. See, when I look at things that in my natural, then I'm looking at that a down, a downward place. But when you're up on the mountaintop, you can sure see a lot farther than you can when you're down at the base of the mountain. And God wants to elevate us because he sees in such a way. And so here it says that he was grieved when he made man. That he was sorrowful that, that man because why? Man did not put his trust in God. So when we're not trusting God, we're grieving God. When we're not believing that God is God and able to meet us right where we live, we're grieving God. When he is telling us and encouraging us to live a life that will bring him glory and honor, and we choose to go another way, we're grieving God. And it's, sometimes it's hard for us because we don't think that God's touched by many things. Because we think it's got to be just down our outright sin. But what disobedience? What is disobedience? Sin. Sin. So you didn't go out and shoot somebody, didn't hold somebody up. All you did was say no to God. I don't want to do it that way. I don't see it that way. I'm not walking the extra mile, not turning the cheek, not giving them the shirt off my back. <laughs> they put themselves in that situation, they can get themselves out. Nobody was there to help me when I was going through mine. Oh, that's that woe me thing again. Yeah. Because, see, I found that in the midst of my trouble, God has always strategically put people in my path. What about you? Has God not put somebody in your path at a time when you needed it most? A crowd in your path when you needed it most. Somebody flashed you a smile when you needed a smile, a word of encouragement. Didn't seem like much, but man, did they do something that just turned your day around. God knows what we stand in need of and he wants us to understand his heart. That he wants us to know that when we're not doing what, it, what he has called us to, he is touched by that. But then we also know then that when he's also touched then when we're doing it right. That he is saying, that's my boy. That's my gal. That's, those are mine. Those are mine. When he sees us doing the things that he's calling us to do. Only a personality can love, hate, care, and grieve. So then God is a living being. And that God is a, a, a alive. That there is life in him. We have life in Christ. We have life in God because God is a living, living deity. He's alive. No statue. He's alive. He's a spirit. The nature of God. John, 1 John. 4, 8. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. What is that saying to you? It should be a, a verse that should set you free. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. What does that give you insight on? God cares about us. But what does it tell us about the world in which we live in? God loves it. Not the world, but we got love okay. That God is love. But what else is it reminding us? I heard the men talking about last night. They were saying they were talking about the, the stuff going over overseas, how the Palestinians and all the things that are going on. We talked about the things that life and the things that we're seeing here. And we're wondering, why can man do these things to man? Because they don't know God's love. Now, you, you can't tell me that you love the Lord and that you want to put a noose around my neck and hang me. 
because I love Jesus. And I want to stand on the things that the, the Lord has called us to stand on. But that day is coming. Persecution is coming. And they're going to come because why? They do not have the love of God operating in their heart and in their lives. And when you don't have that operating in you, how can you expect someone to love when they don't know God's kind of love? Man's kind of love has limits on it. And I don't care if you're a person who says, I love you that much. I can tell you if you're around me long enough, or around some of you long enough. Huh? They will find that they've had enough of you. And you know what we say, people and family, just like fish. After three days, they just begin to stink. What is encouraging us is that you can recognize in the thing that people are troubled with. Because how was your life when it did not have the love of God operating in you? How was your life? So then if you're seeing messes around you, then you need to know that automatically that you should know. There's a lack of love of God operating in them. And when we see children of God coming at each other like the world comes at, then we have to remind them, do you not have the love of God operating in you? Because if you do, children of God don't act that way. Children of God do not act that way. We're not of the world. We may live here, but we're not of it. For our kingdom is with him. And so here the word is just telling us that we ought to recognize them when people are struggling in their life. There's a lack of love of God operating in them. So you may ask the question, do you know Jesus? Do you know Jesus? Why are you asking me that? Because I don't see no love. Well, I don't believe in Jesus, I can tell. Because I don't see no love. We should not be blinded by the things that we see going on around us when the Word of God illuminates and allows us to see that the struggle of man is a lack of the love of God operating in them. And see, because if you love the Lord, you'll not only be a hearer of the Word, you'll be what? See, so again, even when I tell you that I love the Lord and you see me act in any old way, he said, but that means you don't love the Lord, nor do you love His Word. Because if you loved His Word, then you would be applying it to your life. And so here, we're just looking. Now this personality of God and the nature of God, that God is love. And it says God is described four ways in the Bible. It says since God cannot be defined, they are incomplete. However, they do throw light upon the nature of God, and they are. God is love. 1 John 4, 8. The nature of God in His divine compassion. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. Number two, God is light. 1 John 1, 5. The nature of God's divine character. There is no darkness in Him. This is the message we have heard from Him and declare to you. God is light and in Him there is no darkness at all. <laughs> if there is no darkness in God at all and Jesus comes into our life in our life what then should we have going off inside of us then if we have the light going off inside of us and we're lighthouses standing out on up on a high place then it ought to be a light then that somebody can see don't tell me you're a light and then you got this cover over it and I can't see nothing coming out of you we have to uncover And to uncover they mean that I have to become obedient to the things of the Lord to begin to allow those things to begin to come out of me that I might walk strong and make a difference and be able to encourage you. When I'm in darkness, if you got some light shining, guess what? You can help me get to the place where I need to be. Okay, maybe not. Yeah. If you let your light so shine, they will see your what? And you'll see the good works. 
the things of him coming out of you. Brother, you got your light shining. Well, I, you know, we're told to walk in faith, walk in love, uh, walk in the light as he is the light. How do I get there? Just keep following me, brother. I'll get you. <laughs> Just keep on following me, brother. I'll help you get there. I don't know about that, buddy. <laughs> and don't untie the rope. <laughs> so God is light. And it says because him, there's no darkness in him. I understand that we're a house in this flesh and we're going to struggle in this flesh. But if I remind myself who I am in Christ, if we're reminding of ourselves, you started your day saying, I am in Christ Jesus and I am the light of the world. I am the light of the world. When, when there's darkness around me, I come and the darkness has to scatter because why? I got his life in me and his life in me is the light of man. I got light. And if i got light operating in me, then I'm going to start my day out trying to be bright, trying to be a light, trying to make a difference. That's somebody if I see. I'm not doing it because I want attention. I'm doing it because that's who we are. See, if you're just operating in what you have, then the light of God ought to be coming out of you. The love of God that is in you ought to be manifested in you. Because why? That's just what we do as children of God. I think we struggle many times because we don't understand that the natural byproduct or the spiritual byproduct of God through Jesus Christ is that we are light in the midst of darkness. It is a byproduct. You have love of God in you. You have the life of Christ in you and his life then is the light of men, then you don't have to work at being light. It's there. The question is, do you let it shine or don't you? On a cloudy day, is the sun still shining on a cloudy day? Yeah. You may not see it because of the clouds, but it's still shining. Now, some of you may be walking in a cloud. Maybe that's what it is. No? Praise the light doesn't come until after a pot of coffee. He said a coffee. I've been around, Ray. It takes a pot of coffee. The light of man should be there that that is visible to all, even when we don't even feel like being light. Have you not done a godly thing even when you didn't feel like being godly? See, so you have chose to let the light shine. And if you're choosing to make the light shine in that circumstance, that situation, why can't we not do it in all situations? And even if I come short of, at it, of it at times, if I'm gaining on this, then I'm going to be able to get 80% of the time, Dottie. Maybe 85. I might even strive now to say I might be able to get to, to, to 90. I understand I, 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 if I get to 100, I'm soon to mess it up probably, but I'm going to be striving for the perfection. Every athlete who has had his greatest moment. And they may have set a record in what they're doing. The golfer. Who has just won the tournament. And he has broke the course record. In and, and, and the way that he had done it. X amount. And, and minus under par. And he will go back and tell you. She'll go back and tell you. I could have done better on that hole. And I didn't shoot that one just right. It, it went in, but I, I know what I did wrong, but I, I, got, I got away with it. They're still critiquing their game. And see, so as we as children of God, if we were to critique our game, we would get better at it. But we don't understand that as children of God, that since we're exercising our faith, we ought to find ourselves getting better at what we do. Getting better. And so, look around tonight. Look at, just take a quick look at the people around you. How 
How bright are you shining to them? Now, we're not talking about the newlyweds right now. They're just blinded in love. That's right. And, don't, and you guys have been married all those years, don't you tell them it'll wear off because it don't. It don't. It don't. It just gets gooder and good. Amen. Amen. God is a consuming fire. Hebrews 12, 28 through 29. This is the nature of God in His divine holiness. Therefore, since we have received a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful and so worship God acceptably with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. What is that saying to you? What are you hearing in those scriptures? Anyone? I heard an expression, I'm on fire for the Lord. Okay. All right. So what, what do you think they're saying? What, what do you think that, that's, that they're trying to get across? When you have said that, what were you trying to say? It's full of the Holy Spirit. The light. It's exciting bright. So then, what does that mean then that you're doing? Follow the Lord. Huh? Follow the Lord. Follow, being obedient. Find yourself being open to what God, the Holy Spirit, is trying to do in your heart. You find yourself saying yes to Him instead of saying no. You find yourself saying, Lord, not my will, but your will be done. When we find ourselves in understanding that God is operating, it says, therefore, this is the nature of God in His divine holiness. Therefore, since we, have our, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful and so worship God acceptably with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. He says that he is powerful with, and that consuming fire, it is turning up the heat, the draw, the, 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 the garbage that is in us is coming to the top, being skimmed off, that the pureness of God will begin to be revealed in us. This consuming fire allows us to understand, you did not know, I did not understand darkness until the light came on. It's only when Christ comes into your heart do you understand just how dark, dark is. When we say that we're not in relationship with God. You don't understand that until you come into the light of God and you just realize just how bad you were. I remember saying to Anita, I really wasn't all that bad. And she said, are you kidding? Are you kidding? I said, well, I wasn't as bad as this one and that one and that one. But when you're using him as your measuring stick, amen, we all going to come up short. Yes, ma'am? I was going to say, it says with reverence and awe, that means he's not the man upstairs, and he's not JC, and he's not all this other. When I get there, I'm going to ask him, why this and why that? Awe stands out to me. That awe and that reverence is the fact that we recognize who He is. That He is God. And when we were studying a couple years ago, when we were looking at the names of God, we were talking about how that they broke it down so that we would begin to know Him as this, know God as this, that, that He is our, our protector, that He is our, our shield, He's our He is our, our, our Provider, he is our, our 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 surgeon, our savior. He is the one that cleanses us. He is the one that, and we begin to look at him in all of these different areas. That says this is who he is. They broke it down. The Jewish people broke it down so they could say, "My God is this. My God is this. My God is this." And they had a word for each one of them as they were describing the character of God. And what it did was begin to allow them to put their hand on it to get a better glimpse of who he is. Because when you just say, God, what does that mean? What has he been for you? Well, has he been your healer, your savior? He's been the rock on which you stood on. He's been your provider. He's been your king. He's been your shepherd. He's been your peace. 
He's been those things that you have needed for your life, but it says that when we break that down, then the awe begins to become real in us because we realize that without Him, truly we can do nothing. But because of Him, our lives are so, so much better because of Jesus. Consuming fire. Our God is consuming fire. He is that that continues to deal with us. So I like the idea that consuming fire is also a constant fire, that he continues to come. I, I thank God that you get here and that's a good place because you've never been here before. But he, that consuming fire then says, but well, let's go here. Then the consuming fire says, then let's go here. The consuming fire says, then let's go here. The consuming fire keeps coming and says, let's go here. He's a consuming fire because even when you say, I'm not as bad as I used to be, he said, that's fine, you're not, but let's take it to here. Consuming fire continues to reveal to us that we're lacking in the nature of God that is in us, where He's calling us to. If you're desiring to do a great work for our Lord and Savior, for God Almighty, the Creator of all things, will we be able to give Him our best when we're here, compared to here, or compared to here, or compared to here, or compared to here? or comparative here. I'm saying that the Word is telling us because He is, that He's saying He's also making a way for us to begin to come into a closer understanding of His love for us, but also the call that He's placed upon our lives as light in the midst of the darkness. That He's calling us to this place of being able to say, Lord, I can trust You. And Lord, and it's all right that, I, that I, I, this is not where I want to go, but I'll go there because of who you are. I'll do that because of who you are. I'll take that step because of who you are. Because, Lord, I'm finding you to be faithful in every area of my life. And so how could I not trust you now, even though I don't understand it all? So when we go look at that, we go back to those others where we talked about that. We have that. He is God of love. He's a God who cares for us. A God that we can cast our cares before Him because why? He cares about what goes on in our life. You said so. What's that? We can just skip that. Fall. Okay. That's the real trip. To that next step. To the next step. To the next step. Our willingness to let go of us and more of him. It's no longer I that lives, but it is Christ that lives in me. So if I begin to apply that then to my life, it's no longer I that lives, but it's Christ that lives in me. The more I apply that to my life, as we apply it to our life, it's no longer I that lives, but it is Christ who lives within me. Would that then take us to another place in him? But it ain't my will, but thy will be done. Or when we go back and we look at the text as we started out the year, that his ways are not our ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. In fact, it says then his ways and his thoughts are higher than our ways and our thoughts. So when we begin to apply that and begin to understand that, will we not find ourselves growing in our relationship that we know then that our desire then increases and so then when that desire increases within us, then we find ourselves saying what we heard earlier, I'm on fire for the things of the Lord. And it happens because you're seeing that God's way is better than our way. Now see, we know that. We do know that. God's way is better than our ways. But we still sometimes think that my way still ain't all that bad. Huh? I understand, God, I, I, I'm not here, but you know, this ain't a bad idea either. <laughs> the glory of God. So he is our consuming fire, but then it says God is a spirit. This is the nature of God, and in his divine essence, God is a spirit. And his worshipers must worship him in the spirit and in truth. It doesn't say worship him by the spirit. It says enter into the spirit. 
Worship him in the spirit. You have the spirit because why? It says his life in us is the light of men. So I have the spirit of God in me. You have the spirit of God in you. So then it says because he is a spirit, then we stop being flesh or body, soul, and spirit. We stop being that. Body, soul, and spirit. But we now are spirit, soul, and body. For we're led by the spirit, and through the spirit then, that man then is being transformed by the renewing of our heart, our mind, because of the word of God, because of like, him revealing himself to us, that allows me then to walk out, it allows us to walk out the things that God is calling us to when we are spirit, soul, and body. Because the only way that the body is able to walk in the things of God is when the Spirit of God is leading us. And the Word of God and through the Spirit of God is transforming us. That the body then is able to be obedient to the call of God that is in our heart and in our lives. So He is not only a, a, a Spirit, but the Spirit of God is operating in us. And it says, and we as worshipers. So then when we look at Romans 12, that it says that it is our act of worship. As we make ourselves a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is our reasonable service. It is our act of worship. And that we are not conformed to this world, but we're being transformed by the renewing of our mind. How does that come? Because the Spirit is in us. The mind then is being transformed because of the word of God and our willingness to say yes to that word that it then allows our bodies to walk out. Have you ever found yourself in a situation, and I'm going to put it like this so it doesn't happen this way, but you may feel like it does. You don't have to. You do. You don't really have to. But you do. <laughs> that tells me that I do have some say so on, on what I walk out. That I can use these legs for the glory of God or I can use these legs for mischief. But I have a choice in this matter. I have a choice because of the Spirit of God that is transforming me. And even though my flesh rebels against it, my flesh will do what I tell it to do. <coughs> because I'm led by the Spirit. We're led by the Spirit. And we're renewed through the Spirit, the soul that is in us. And so this Word of God then is able to cut between the natural and the soul of man. The bone of it's able to split. The Word of God is able to make it possible for us to walk victorious in Christ Jesus. The attributes, attributes of God reveal His nature. Do not think that His attributes are abstract, but as vital mediums through which His holy nature is unveiled. Attributes ascribed to Him such as life is ascribed to God. John 5, 26. For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son also to have life in himself. And he has given him authority to judge because he is the Son of Man. A. The attributes of God in his nature. That they are there and, and, and that he has given those to, to Christ. So it says that that through which his holy nature is unveiled. That is revealed because of the Spirit of God that is in us. And that that he has, it is being made known to us through the Holy Spirit. And because of the Father, the Son has authority. And it says that, it says that, and whoever he gives life to will have eternal life. He has authority to give life to those that will trust in him. All knowledge is ascribed to God. So it says that all of this comes from, all authority comes, all life comes, all knowledge comes. Great is our Lord and mighty 
and power. His understanding has no limit. It begins to let us know that not only is he the life giver, but God knows everything and he is mighty in power. God really does know everything. We get messed up sometimes. Maybe not you of that older generation. <laughs> but we find ourselves living in this day in which we live that I hear people say many times, well, that old saying of parents really don't work today was that kids should be seen and not heard. I was raised on because I said so. They did not have to explain themselves to me when they said no. Why? Because I said no. I thought maybe they need to tell me something more. And they did. <laughs> Ask me that one more time. <laughs> Made it clear. And you know what? I was not scarred because I did what they said. Because they said it. They made it clear to me. I'm the parent. You're not. In fact, it was said this way. When you start paying the bills, <laughs> then you can just do whatever you want to. My brother-in-law once said to his mom, Mom, would you go ahead and get this for me? And my father-in-law said, If you want to order a wife, then you better get one. <laughs> he was just like, no, that's your mom. She is not there to serve you. You're grown, get up. You, you want somebody to serve you, then you better marry somebody. <laughs> Find you a wife. Huh? It don't work that way, folks. In God's world, it does, Naomi. We're sorry, Dale. <laughs> what we know, though, is telling us here that all knowledge belongs to God. And if God knows, do we trust Him to know? The beginning and the end. It may not make sense. It may not be exactly what we want. The couple has longed for a child. Several miscarriages along the way. <coughs> and finally they have this child in their arms and eight months after the child is born they discover there's a sickness that the baby has. And over the next four months, they watch this baby deteriorate and then finally die. And the question is, Lord, we waited so long, why then do you give us a child and this fear happens? And they ask the question, why? Did they get an answer? They didn't give an answer. Why? Now I can tell you why. Because we live in a sinful world. We are born of a sinful nature. And sin produces death. But we want to know, God, why did you give me this? Why did you allow me to have this? And then this happened. God's in control. But where we begin to know the difference it's when we allow the Spirit of God to now minister to our soul. If we allow God to be God, if we allow His Word to comfort us, if we allow the Holy Spirit to hold us, we will find that who He is will be revealed to us. I, I, I know that we have shouted at God. We've been angry with God. That we've felt that He has dropped the ball, that He has let us down. But we also found ourselves getting back up and realizing without you, we can't make it. Without you, this surely would have overtaken me. Without you, I, I, I would have been a, a 
wadded up mess. But because of you, I'm able to face another day. I've had the fortune or misfortune, however you may look at it, to come to the understanding when it comes to death. For those who are alive, tomorrow comes. May not want to face it. Clock comes, ticks, sun comes back up. And you may even take off a time from work. But then there's a time that you got to go back to work. Life goes on. You, 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 you don't feel like doing anything, but life goes on. And if life is going on, should you go on in it with your strength or in your weakness, let God make you strong. So then we have this word of God then that begins to minister to us. And it says, would you not trust this word that God has given you and allow him to be God now into your life? <clears throat> See, I, I, if we're going to say then that I believe that God has all knowledge, he understands all things, he has no limit in his understanding. Oh, he's a, a mighty God and he has all power in himself. Then that means I have to trust him in the times of my life. In the times of your life, when life seems to be so unfair, that God is God, and I will trust Him. How then was David able to then bathe, change his clothes, clean himself up, and say, now I'm ready to eat? He says, God knows all things. But while I was in the trenches, and even though I know God has spoke these things, I know that he's such a loving, caring God. A consuming fire that can be moved by the prayers of his children. And so he fasted. He got before the Lord that the child's life might be spared, even though God said the child would die. Because he says, I also know this part about my God. We matter. We matter to Him. And so when we begin to look at the whole picture, that begins to allow us to begin to get a hold of a part here when it says all knowledge is ascribed to God. That it says that He is great is our Lord and mighty in power. His understanding has no limit. Then it says all power is ascribed to God. Revelation 19.6 that I heard was sounded like a great multitude, like a roar of rushing waters, and like loud pearls of thunder shouting, Hallelujah, for our Lord God Almighty reigns. Sound like the angels were on fire for God. All of a sudden, something began to happen. It says, all of a sudden, they began to shout, Hallelujah, for our God, Lord God Almighty, reigns. So again, if I begin to understand that He's the Almighty God, and that He reigns, and that He knows all things, all powers in His hand, then can I trust Him at the hardest times of my life? Man's on a mountain. He has drove those tags or whatever inside of the mountain. The rope is all hooked up. What's it called? Huh? Okay, and he's nailed that thing into the spike. <laughs> and he's got a rope hooked to it. He's hooked to it. Somebody down below is hooked to it. And they're moving. And they're moving, and all of a sudden, the person on the bottom slips. He fills the tub. What if they put the trust in? What do you call it? Keton. Keton. They put their trust in that spike. <laughs> <laughs> they drove it in there for a reason. 
For they said, we might slip, but this here will keep us from falling. <coughs> they put the trust in it. And many of them would tell you, that thing saved my life. Saved my life. Man can climb up on a mountain, go thousands of feet up in the air, and trust their life on a spike. <laughs> and yet we struggle with an almighty God. Because darkness is light to God. 
that I can't escape him. He is ever present for we who are in him. And when I begin to understand that, we begin to allow that to operate in our heart, then it says, where can I go from your spirit? If I really got a hold of that, if you really get a hold of that, if people, if the children of God really get a hold of it, where could I go to escape you? And the answer is nowhere. Now, I thought my parents had a little bit of God operating in Because they seem to found out everything that I have done in secret. And sometimes they knew it before I got home. It didn't seem to be no matter where I went, where I go. Now this is what it looks like. This is what it looks like when we look at this text. I'm going to give you an example of that. Now maybe I know it's just a, a shadow of what this is saying. But this is what it looks like. I was a teenager, 13, 14, somewhere in there, and had a neighborhood place, a center where you could go to, to the dance, and the teenagers were there, and I told my dad, I, I'm going to go there, and I was there, I was having a great time. I looked over at a side door in the center, and my dad was standing in the doorway. He said, I was just checking to see if you were where you said you were going to be. Now, I don't know then for the next four or five years of my life if he ever stood in another doorway where I was supposed to be, but I dare not be somewhere else because why? I thought he might show up. <laughs> So then if I understand then that my God sees everything, knows everything, he knows all about me, why can't I not then grab a hold of that truth as I got a hold of his truth when he said, I was just checking on you. Just make sure you're where you said you're going to be. Now my sister didn't care nothing about that. But that was the sister that mom just would say, let's start the day off. I'm going to whip you. <laughs> because, oh, they might see it on, on the internet now. Sheila, that's her name, was subject to do anything. Yeah. She didn't care that they might have been in the doorway. She was going to take her chances. Me, on the other hand, he got me one time. I was there. He may not have shown up at another place, but if I said I was going to be there, I was going to be there. If I said I was going to be at somebody's house, I was going to be at somebody's house. If I said I was going to go to this place here, and then I'm coming, that I did exactly what I said, because why? I didn't know what he was up to. God says here, I see everything. And even when you're in the depths of hellishness, that not only does he see us there, his arms are not short. He's able to get us to bring us up to a place where he's at. I thank God for it that he sees everything. <clears throat> that he sees us and where we're living and sees where we're at so then that we can have this understanding that the fulfilling of, of who he is that where can I flee from your presence? If I go to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hands will guide me and your right hand will hold me fast. That it tells us that he not only does he sees us, but we also have his strength no matter where we might find ourselves at. That he'll give us what we need to overcome the circumstance, situation we find ourselves in because his right hand, he holds us fast. God is everywhere, present. 
but he is not in everything. If God were in everything, man could worship any object and he would be worshiping God. God is a spirit, John 4, 24. God is a spirit and his worshipers must worship him in spirit and in truth. God is a spirit, must worship him in spirit and truth. Says that he's not in everything, but he is everywhere. Sometimes we're comforted. Because as Barb said, we like to touch something. We like to feel something. I, I, I knew a gentleman that when he wanted to get close to God, he had a key to the church and he would just go into church and he says, I just feel the presence of the Lord. I, I just there, when I'm dealing with stuff, I just want to go and just be in that place. I, I've talked to people that said that they, they went to the cemetery and, and they with a loved one and though they understood they're not there, they just felt that they could pour out their heart that somebody was listening. Even though they know that God was listening, they knew that somebody that had loved them, who cared for them, when it was said, that's a tangible thing. And so we sometimes struggle in our natural, as Barb said, because we can't see, that we can't touch, we can't relate to. But here it tells us that God is a spirit, and he's everywhere, but he's not into everything. I do not have to have something standing on the table and, and think that I can talk to it and look at it because that's where God's at. God is in an earthen vessel. He is in you. If you accepted Christ as your personal Savior, He is in you. He is, we are a spirit. He is a spirit. And He has deposited His spirit within us. And so you may feel comfortable with your cross around your neck. I don't have a problem with that. You may feel better. You may hold on to it because sometimes just holding on to something. I understand that. But you need to know if you don't have nothing to hold on, he's still there. You can grab him and he'll grab you. It doesn't matter where you find yourself at. He is there. He's not in the stuff. I don't have to have anything carved out. I don't have to have anything shiny. I don't have to have bling to have Christ. I have him in us. And so it says that God is, God is everywhere present, but he is not in everything. If God were in, in, in everything, man could worship any object, any object, man, woman, or beast, anything. He would be worshiping God, but God is the spirit. And we must worship him in spirit and in truth. So as we look at part one of, of God, it talked to us about that he reveals himself to us. He wants us to know. They began with the Bible reveals God as the only infinite and eternal being. Having no beginning and no end. He is the creator and sustainer of all things. He is the supreme personal intelligence and the righteous ruler of his universe. He is life, and therefore the only source of life. For John 5, 26, For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son also to have life in himself. We know that the Bible tells us that his life is the life of man, that eternity is through Jesus Christ and through him alone. The Bible has revealed that God is. So because I believe, and we looked at the Bible, that was our first study. The Bible, we said that it was given to us through the Holy Spirit. As the Holy Spirit has spoken to man, and man began to put it down. As the Holy Spirit dictated. He may have wrote it in his language, but it was the Holy Spirit that was giving that to him. And he wrote it down. It told us that we can trust God's word from Genesis to Revelation. It told us that his word is light to us. That his word is his word. And it's not something by the thoughts and not given by the thoughts or, or a man's ideal on how things ought to be. But it's by the spirit of God who had given it, had uttered, made it alive to man. That man might put down the word of God. 
It's not the words of men, it's the word of God that has been given to us. So we believe that word. We believe that the Bible is God's word in Genesis and Revelation, everything in between. We believe it even when we understand it or don't understand it. We believe that the Bible is. And because I believe and because we believe that the Bible is, we also then believe what the Bible then says about God. That God is God and the only way that man can have an understanding of God's love is comes through Jesus Christ. Who is love? Who is God? And because of that, we can have the relationship with the Lord. It doesn't matter then what anybody else says because why? We believe the Bible. We believe what the Bible says and we believe what the Bible says about God. We believe that the Word of God tells us there is no relationship with the Father unless you know the Son. That's what we believe. So I don't have to argue it with anyone. Why I believe what I believe? Because why? I believe the Bible. Why? Because we believe the Bible. We believe what the Word of God says. We believe that God gave us this Word. That we can begin to be, have a relationship with Him. To know His heart. And begin to know who we are in Him. And other people may not agree with what we believe in. But it still doesn't stop it from being true to us who are in Christ Jesus. It's life. It is life to us. It is that that will sustain us. It is that that will hold us. And we have to believe that God is. And that He has given us the Word of God that we might begin to know Him. So we believe this. So other people may say that, well, I believe in reincarnation. It's not in the book. I believe that man just dies and then it's just the end. That's not in the book. I believe that man dies and then he becomes a God and he has a, 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 a universe of his own. That's not in the book. I believe that if it's not in the book, it don't matter what they believe. It doesn't matter. If it's not in God's Word, and we believe God's Word, we believe what God has said about Himself. We believe that He said, I search, there is no other God. I am it. That's what we believe. And when you know what you believe, then it doesn't matter what angels say, what so-and-so says here, or some big shot in the American Baptist. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what the person that's preaching behind the pulpit, if they say something that does not line up with God's Word, then we need to question to say, Pastor, did you get something mixed up? Or you think about something, you said this, I'm not sure where you were going with it. Because the Word of God is... Amen. So next week we'll be starting part two of God. And so everyone should have a copy of part two. It says part two on the top. Part two, outline two. God. All right. Any questions? Any questions? Everybody get a chance to sign the, uh, the prayer book. Yes. Any questions? If not, I'll have a word for us. Father, we come tonight, Lord, and we thank you. We thank you for who you are, Lord. You are God. We thank you, Lord, that you're the creator of all things, and you are the lover of our soul. We thank you, Lord, that you looked past our faults and you saw our needs. We thank you, Lord, that you had a plan to restore man back to you. And Lord, and we thank you, Lord, that you have chosen us. And Lord, and I thank you tonight, Lord, for each and every person that is here. 
We ask, Lord, that you would just continue to open our understanding to your word. Write it upon our heart, Lord, and then, Holy Spirit, we believe that you will bring it to remembrance. Lord, love us as your sons and daughters, for it says you chasten those you love. You don't allow, allow us to become comfortable in our mess. And Lord, and we thank you for that kind of perfect love you have for us. I thank you tonight, Lord, for your word that lets me know that you never lose sight of us, no matter where we've been, and no matter where we've gone. We thank you tonight, dear Heavenly Father, that when it seemed that the prodigal had went as far as he could, you were still there, <laughs> looking from afar off. Lord, I thank you tonight for the way you love us, the way you strengthen us, guide us. We thank you for the patience you have towards us. But Lord, in this day in which we live, I pray tonight, Lord, that we would be challenged by you to step it up as you turn it up a notch. That you're calling us, Lord, to greatness that is in you. We pray tonight, Lord, for community unity. We pray tonight, dear Heavenly Father, Lord, that the finances will come in. And we thank you, Lord, for those we are talking to and, and that they're doing uh, that they are going to give. The promises are there, Lord. We're just waiting for the fulfillment of. Lord, we're believing, Lord, for the, the time at the festival, Lord. We're believing, Lord, uh, for the sharing and the teaching that we'll get on Thursday evening, Lord, that, that it will also be an encouragement, Lord, for us to witness Christ. We thank you, Lord, for Ben and I as we go to the meeting on Thursday with the, uh, the board there at the festival that they will understand, Lord, that this is a God thing and not a, a, a man thing. Uh, Lord, I, I pray tonight, Lord, that lives will be touched by men and women, boys and girls who want to let your gospel be known to those who are lost. Lord, we're believing, Lord, for transformation of lives, Lord, because of the witnessing of Christ Jesus. And so, Lord, as we go, each and every one of us, in our areas of responsibility, I ask, Lord, that you would anoint us, walk with us. We thank you for the seeds that were planted and watered in Brooklyn, and we're believing you for the increase. We thank you, Lord, for the opportunities you give us in our daily walk. And, Lord, I pray that I will not shrink back from the call that you have placed upon my life and on the lives of those, Lord, that are in this room tonight. And so I ask, Lord, that you would just continue to meet us, we ask that you remember, Lord, Barb Bannister. We ask that you remember Jerry Eddy, Lord. We ask that you remember Sheldon, Lord, uh, going through, Lord, with Sue Weaver. There's others, Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, fighting that thing called cancer. Lord, we know that's not cancer. We're dealing with NGS6, but her, her vitals are in not a good place. And we ask that you minister to her, Lord. There's something going on with her blood. And so, Lord, these things are there. You, you're aware of it. But I ask that you teach us how to pray. Teach us, Lord, how to look to you, the author and finisher of our faith. We thank you, Lord, for the union between Ben and Mandy, Lord. We ask, Lord, blessings, Lord, upon their lives, Lord, and that their marriage, Lord, would be entwined with you. Be with them as they raise their family, Lord, to be lovers of you. Give Ben the wisdom on how to know, how to love his wife, how to honor her. And may she be quick, Lord, to encourage him and respect him. And so, Lord, we thank you tonight for our wives, our sons, our daughters, our, our husbands. We thank you, Lord, for mom and daddy, brothers and sisters. We thank you for the neighbor, even that neighbor. Now go with us as we go from here. Be our strength. And may your light shine, Lord, in all that we do and say. In Jesus' name we pray. Let every heart say amen. 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 amen.